So today let's see what's inside of this stun gun and how does it work. It was donated by a viewer, so big thanks for the donation and now let's take a look at it. It says 200,000 volt, but those voltage ratings on stun guns are always a nonsense. This voltage would make a 20 cm discharge. And it seems to come from Germany. The text on the box is in German and English. So that's the box. And now let's try to open it and test it and see what's inside of it. And of course before I use it I have to thoroughly get acquainted with directions for use. And of course now let's open it. Some warnings and here is the stun gun and the strap for it and the manual in the box and that's it. And the manual is in German and of course there is going to be a ridiculous amount of warnings and those dangerous zones around those electrodes. And here it shows a picture where you are supposed to shock a person and you can run it continuously for up to 10 seconds and then it has to be off for at least 2 seconds. And if the time between individual operations are less than 2 seconds, they are adding up and it has to be at most 10 seconds, then it shuts down and you have to release the button for at least 2 seconds. And now let's take a look at it. This is just something to mount it on something. This holder with a screw and the stun gun is here. It has this push button, but also you have to turn on this switch to use it. And there is also this safety strap. You put it around your hand and if somebody pulls it from your hand, it disables it and it doesn't work without this plug. And here are those test electrodes and those contact electrodes. And the arc is going from this electrode to this one unless you're giving a shock to somebody using those electrodes. And it uses a 9 volt battery but there is none. So let's try to give it an alkaline battery. It's 9 volt alkaline battery. And of course you have to put the battery in like this probably and then plug it in or does it go this side first? Well, that's a bit tricky. It probably is meant to go in and then you have to plug it after this. So let's put the cover back. And does it work? Now this switch is off, so it doesn't do anything. And when the switch is on, it makes those sparks. And it smells of ozone. It makes nice sparks. But the battery is probably not entirely full. Let's try a rechargeable battery instead. And it seems to run a bit better with the rechargeable battery. It sparks at a higher frequency. And of course I'm using quite bright lights. Now let's test it with a dimmer light. And now it's better visible. Without this switch it doesn't work. And without this plug it also doesn't work. Should I try to run it for 10 seconds continuously? Well, let's try it. And now it disables after 10 seconds. And should I try to touch it? Well, It gives some shocks, but it's probably much more unpleasant if you use it on some other body parts. But now of course let's open it and see what's inside of it and how does it work. I can see no screws, so is it clicked together or glued together? Let's try to somehow pry it open. The plastic is probably welded. I have to somehow pry it open. He managed to open it up to here and now the switch probably comes out. Now it's opening here and now it's starting to come apart. Let's try to pry here. 
And that's it. So let's take a closer look at it. Here is the battery connector. The safety plug goes here. So it's just a switch basically. And there is something in a heat shrink. And a power transistor. A resistor. Some diode here. A capacitor. A freight transformer. This switch. Some resistor. What's this? Some diode. Another resistor in a series with this one. And here is this push button. And here is probably some big capacitor. And here is some module in a resin. Is there some other board in it or just a transformer? I guess this could be just a transformer in it. And it comes out and the board is held in a place using those horrible plastic pins which are molten and pressed. So we just have to break it. There is no other way of removing it. And that's it. And it all comes out. So now it's completely out of the plastic housing and... What's this thing? Is it a spark gap? Is this one spark gap based? Instead of having a thyristor or SCR? Probably yes. So this seems to be a primitive spark gap based stun gun, but with some electronics on top of it. And maybe this one is botched in and some other versions don't have it. I guess this is the timer to disable it after 10 seconds. But besides this, it's quite primitive. It's probably just a single transistor self-oscillating inverter, boosting the voltage of the battery, charging this capacitor, and then discharging it through the spark gap into the other transformer and creating a very high voltage. It basically boosts the voltage in a few steps. The first stage boosts the voltage of the battery to about a couple kilovolts to charge this capacitor and then it goes in pulses through the spark gap into this transformer, further boosting the voltage to several tens of kilovolts. And this module probably doesn't have any electronics in it, it's probably just a transformer. A potted high voltage transformer on a ferrite rod or even an iron rod. But now of course let's try to see what's inside of the heat shrink. Let's remove it using scissors and... Is there a board? Yes, there is a board with some electronics. What the hell? One wire is going into the heat shrink, not into the board? Well, it's a shielding. And four wires go into this board. With some chip or microcontroller. And several transistors. It seems like five transistors in it or three pin packages. Might not be transistors and some resistors and capacitors. A diode here. This is probably also a diode. And some SMD capacitors. And this diode is probably a high voltage diode. It's in a quite a long package. And here is the power transistor, BD912. And here you can see the spark gap. And this is definitely not something that would last too long. And the distance in it is probably a bit under one millimeter. And now of course let's take a look at the schematic of it. Here is the battery, the negative goes through this push button and safety switch and then the voltage of the battery goes into this decoupling capacitor and then it's a single transistor self oscillating inverter. And there is also this timer module which I will explain later. This power transistor basically switches the primary of this transformer with a ferrite core and there is a feedback winding to make it oscillate. And for this to start up, there is this startup resistor. Initially, when it's connected, a small current goes through the base of the transistor, this resistor, this winding and this resistor. So the transistor turns partially on and then there is this positive feedback from this feedback winding, making it oscillate. And when the transistor is on, this side of this winding is positive, this negative. So this one is also positive and this one negative. And it keeps the transistor on. It's a PNP transistor, so it's on when there is a current going from the base out. And to make the current go in this direction, you need a negative voltage on its base, in reference to the emitter. And it's a very primitive and probably not very efficient inverter. There is not even any timing capacitor near the base. 
So probably the transistor stays on until the core of the transformer saturates or there is so much current build up in the primary that the transistor desaturates. And then the voltage disappears from the feedback winding and the current disappears from the base and the transistor turns off. I'm not sure what's the direction of the secondary, but I think it's rectified in the flyback direction. So when the transistor turns off, the polarity of the windings flips, and then this diode charges this capacitor. And the magnetic field collapses in the core, and, and then this side of the feedback winding is no longer positive, and the transistor can turn back on. And this inverter is basically charging this capacitor until there is enough voltage for this spark up to arc over and then the energy from this capacitor goes into the primary of the second transformer and the voltage is further stepped up in this and produces a very high voltage here on the secondary. And this capacitor has those discharging resistors, the UN series probably just because of the high voltage and it probably charges this capacitor to a couple kilovolts. And this capacitor, it's this one, has no marking on it, so I think it's a custom capacitor. And the secondary of this transformer has a very high resistance, about 40 kilo ohms, so it probably has a crazy number of turns, maybe tens of thousands. And the primer has quite a low resistance. And this diode has a high forward voltage drop, about 7.5 volts at low current, couple milliamps. So it has to be a high voltage diode and it's probably multiple diodes in a series in it. And now let's go to the timer module. There is a microcontroller and it's quite overcomplicated, so it's probably not worth reverse engineering it, but basically it has a positive terminal, the negative terminal, the shielding, and this terminal is probably sensing when it's on, when those switches are on, and after 10 seconds it turns this transistor on in it. And this basically brings a positive voltage to this bias of this transistor, basically shunts the base to the emitter, so the current doesn't go through the base and the transistor turns off, and this disables it. And there is also the safety plug with the rope, and, and the switch in it basically works the other way. When you pull it out, it's on, and when this switch is on, it disables it again because it shunts the base to the emitter and removes the current from the base. Not sure why the switch is on this side of the resistor, not here. So it basically shorts the feedback winding. There might be a peak of a high current through this switch because it's not current limited. But very quickly after this, the feedback disappears and the transistor turns off. And it doesn't draw much current. The only current is going through this startup resistor, just a couple milliamps. And of course in operation the current through the feedback winding goes also through this diode. The current basically goes through this diode, from emitter to the base, through this resistor and this winding and the circuit completes. And this is what keeps the transistor on during its on time. And it's switching at a high frequency, several kilohertz. But probably still lower than most switching power supplies because it's still audible. And this diode probably just protects the base of this transistor against reverse current or reverse voltage. But it also protects the transistor in the timer module against reverse voltage. And of course this inverter is probably not very efficient, it's just a big version of a jowl thief. And this part of it is also bloody inefficient. But this is not designed as an energy efficient switching power supply. And this spark up fires several times a second and, of course, as it's getting hotter, its voltage threshold is getting lower and then the sparking frequency might be higher and it's generally quite unstable. And also the electrodes are wearing out. And of course the total life expectancy of this is probably measured in minutes. And it's quite simple and it would probably run without this module. It's just botched on top of it, maybe some safety regulation requires it. Let's try to remove it and see if it still works. Let's just rip it out and see. The module is out, without the module and let's see. It still works. But of course stun guns generally draw quite a bloody current. It might be a couple amps from the battery and it discharges the battery very quickly. It's such a high current for a 9 volt battery that you can call it a destruction rather than a discharge. Not sure if it's a good idea to measure it using my clamp meter, but let's try it. <laughs> 
one and a half amps almost. And this is already with the battery partially discharged. With the new battery it was definitely over two amps. And of course the voltage on the battery probably drops under the load quite a lot. Drops a lot. That was a half discharged nickel metal hydride battery. Now let's go back to the alkaline. Dropping to 5 volts. Let's try to connect an oscilloscope to this primary. I'm better not sticking a solid state oscilloscope into those electromagnetic pulses. It's basically the high frequency switching modulated by the low frequency pulsing of the spark gap. And this is one frame of the video. And you can see a somewhat clean waveform of the inverter. And when I think about this schematic, wouldn't it be better to have a spark gap here and a capacitor here? Just like in a spark gap Tesla coil. Because then when the spark gap ignites, it has a low voltage drop, protecting the power supply from the damped oscillations. With the capacitor here, it forces the damped oscillations into the power supply and it passes a high current through this winding and this diode. When this side swings into negative and this one into positive. But maybe it's so lossy that it doesn't even make damped oscillations. Just a pulse in one polarity. But I'm not sticking any oscilloscope into this section. So that's it and thanks to all of my patrons on Patreon. I really appreciate your support. And of course you can also become my patron to support my channel and get early videos. The link to my Patreon is in the description as well as the link to my Instagram. And in the next episode I plan to take a look inside of those very questionable USB phone chargers.